welcome. My name is Mario Batali, and this is Molto Mario. I'm here with my good friends Naomi, Jake, and Maggie. And today we're talking about Italian food, and more specifically, probably one of the building blocks of Emilia Romagna, one of the most interesting, fascinating, and yet simple to do things at your own house. That's right, fresh pasta al uovo, or egg pasta. It's simple to do, it's easy to think about, and it's one of the most delicious and satisfying things. And when you talk about the matriarchal cuisine of Emilia Romagna and, and yet all of Italy, if there's one thing that children remember as they grow up, it's eating a bowl of pasta that their mom made. And if there's anything that kind of plucks on those heartstrings, it's stuffed pastas and lasagna. And today we're going to make a potato tortelli with just a little bit of butter and sage. Then we're gonna make a tagliatelle with parsnips and pancetta, and we're gonna finish with perhaps the classic of all time, lasagna al forno, and we're gonna make them all in real time so that you can mostly understand. Now, the potato tortelli, as with all tortelli, is just a shape. We'll start with the pasta in a minute, but we wanna make the filling first. It's very simple. We've taken your basic spud, the starchy Idaho classic. We've boiled it with its skin on, we've peeled it, and we've cooked it all the way through. This is no al dente, trendy, wasabi potato. This is just <laughs> your basic spud that we've boiled. And all we do is we pass it through the ricer. Now, if there's one tool outside of this right here, which I'll talk about in a second, that I exhort you to get if you're ever going to use potatoes, it's this ricer thing, which is just kind of like a little plunger or a piston. And you push the potatoes through it. Wow, that was cool. Got some in my eye. <laughs> there you go, right? <laughs> it's just a potato, though, so everything's going to be fun. <laughs> Now, the trick would happen, why this works so well, actually, let's just load it a little more carefully this time. Everybody step back. <laughs> if you just push it through, what happens is you get this light, fluffy potato mass, mm -hmm. as opposed to that kind of mashed potato puree mass that almost looks like it's a little starchy, which is good in its own case. But in a filling like this, we're looking for the ethereal to come to us. So now, to make this filling properly, we're going to take about two-thirds of a cup of the grated, indisputed king of cheeses. That would be Parmigiano-Reggiano. We're going to take two eggs, and we're going to take a mother load of nutmeg, which I'm a big fan of with vegetables that have a little bit of Parmigiano-Reggiano. And what we'll do is we always grate it, because let's face it, if you were in the spice business and you could sell people ground up powder, there's no reason why you wouldn't just sweep up the floor at the end of the day and put it in a jar. <laughs> so if you buy the real thing, then you know that you're going to get the real thing. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but Connecticut, the state just to the north of, of where we are right now, is called the nutmeg steak. And that's because back in uh, colonial times, they were famous for using fake nutmeg and trading it around because nutmeg wasn't necessarily currency, but it was considered very valuable because of its flavor. And they would make these fake nutmegs in Connecticut. So I know that's where Dave Letterman lives, and I'm pretty sure he's got a little nutmeg. supply of some fake <laughs> nutmeg up there. Now we're going to take chives. You don't need them if you didn't want to. This could just be potato, eggs, cheese, and nutmeg. But we love the flavor of chives. And then, most importantly here, when you're making this filling, is to remember it's something you're going to eat, so you just gently bring it together. You don't have to beat the heck out of it. You don't have to bring it to submission. We just want to kind of combine the ingredients so each piece of the potato has been delicately kissed with the indisputable kiss of the indisputed king of cheeses, Parmigiano, <laughs> Reggiano. So there we have it. That's the filling, and you could make this in advance, but we're not in any hurry, so you don't have to make it in advance. You make it to order. You make it right before you're going to make it. Then you make your pasta. You always want to make that first, then you make your pasta. This is basic egg pasta, as they make in Emilia Romagna. You use any kind of flour you have. There's some obsessives in the Italian world that love to use what's called doppio zero, or a double zero flour. You don't have to go buy that, though, unless you feel that you have to capture everything. But I like the idea of using something that's local, so I just use regular old American all-purpose flour. What's double What's zero? Double zero is a particular fine grind. It's kind of halfway between all-purpose flour and cake flour. And it's just the, the fineness that they grind the flour to. It creates a different texture, but I, I, I don't think that it's that radically different. And I wouldn't go out and search for it unless you could bump into it at the grocery store. Now, the trick with bringing wet ingredients into the dry ingredients is always to make sure that it's better to have a little bit more of the wet ingredients than the dry ingredients because it's impossible to reliquify a dried out ball, but it's easy to add more dry ingredients to something that's a little too moist. So this is what's called the well method in English, but they call it la fontana in Italian. And when I lived in Emilia Romagna, each morning we would get up and we would make pasta, and then you measured it by how many eggs it was. And an egg goes for 100 grams of flour, so we would make 
30 eggs or 40 eggs every morning, which was great. And then instead of rolling it through this machine, though, however, we would always roll it by hand between a wooden dowel or a rolling pin and a very rough wooden board. That's because in Emilia Romagna, they felt that the texture of these smooth metal dowels created something that was too liscio, too smooth, and that it didn't hold the sauce, and to the point that they would become obsessing about it. The very first time that I ever went to dinner with these guys, the guys that own this restaurant, we went to a place that was just over the border in Tuscany, but they had deemed it to be still Emilia Romagna, and they brought us out a plate of tagliatelle, and they put it in their mouths, and they looked at each other, and they put their forks down, and it was just like, Damn, this isn't going to work. And we actually left the restaurant. They were so devastated. The Emiliani are particularly obsessed about their food. Now, you want to get your watch off of your wrist because now we're going to bring this together. And when, you can also make this in the mixing bowl of this with a little dough hook. But you're not watching me on this show to do that. So I'm just going to bring it all together. And now you just start to try to squeeze it. And it becomes what looks just a little bit like a dough. And then you start to bring the whole thing together. I'm going to add just a little bit more of the flour. And it becomes a touch thing. Once you're familiar with this, you'll be surprised how quick and how easy it is to make. So now what I'm going to do is bring it to a ball, and we allow this dry stuff to kind of set off to the side. And as that ball comes together, then we start to knead it. Now, it would seem that kneading might become a problem, but in fact, kneading is what develops the gluten, which gives it that kind of al dente ness to it. So you can't over-knead this. And in fact, in the restaurants, when we do it in the restaurants, we make it in a big bowl like this, and we'll allow it to go in the bowl for 45 minutes. It becomes harder and harder and harder as that gluten develops. And it just it becomes the hardest mess at all. But what you then do is you allow it to rest. It'll, it becomes relaxed, and that gluten kind of rests, and then you can work with it. So this I would knead for a long time, and then I would be left with something that looks like this. We wrap it in plastic, and we allow it to rest for about, I don't know, 20 minutes. And then what we do is we just dredge it in this flour, and we get this machine going like this. And you just pass it right through. And then the next number, and you pass it right through. And this machine is something I recommend that people buy because it makes making fresh pasta, as you can see, literally the work of just a few minutes. Now we have our filling there, and we want to bring this pretty thin, although this won't be as thin as if we were going to just make tagliatelle because there's a certain amount of liquidity or moisture to our ripieno or our filling. So what now we're going to do is each of us is going to take a little square and we're going to form a tortello together. Now careful, it's a little sticky. And what we're going to do is take some filling. What's well, that a one was too sticky. Tortello is the shape. If you're not familiar with it, allegedly uh, Venus is cruising around the Emilian countryside back in the pre-Renaissance days. And they're just kind of wondering what the heck's going on, and they're checking into this hotel, and they check into a hotel, and uh, all the cooks think she's the hottest thing, and they go upstairs to, to relax before they're going to have dinner, Venus and her date. <laughs> and uh, one of the cooks sneaks and looks into the keyhole to see in her room, and he sees her uh, belly button. Says, oh my God, I've got to do something about that. Well, he saw her belly button, and what does he want to do? Take about half that out. That's too much. He wants to put potatoes in it? No, no, no. <laughs> that was a good thought. No, what he wants to do is create a pasta in homage to that. So he runs downstairs and creates something, and watch, I'll fold it. Go like that into a triangle, press it down until you have like a triangle filled. There you go, you got it. That's close. Then you bring it around like that, and in the Italian opinion, that looks like Venus's umbilical cord. All right, so now we're going to cook Mine these up. I made a couple more. Are you close? I, we'll, work on, we'll work on this while we're really away. Wrong. But I'm going to drop some in the water right now. When we come back, we'll taste these beautiful homage to Venus's belly button. And then we'll talk a little bit about tagliatelle with pancetta. So stay with us. Welcome back. Our tortelli are just simmering away here. We're going to add some sage to our lightly browned butter. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm an odd number guy. And while that's just kind of simmering away here, and I'm going to actually add just a little bit more butter, I'm going to start the sauce for our next one while we uh, 
while we wait for that to, to finish. And what we're going to do is we're going to take some pancetta and parsnips because I'm a particular fan of onomatopoeia, if you're familiar with that. And it works really tastily together. And pancetta, if you're not familiar with it, is just bacon, Italian style. They take the pork belly, they salt it, then they roll it up, and then they hang it like a salami. If you can't find pancetta, there are literally 150 great American artisanally made bacons all over the place. And if you can find slab bacon, you'll be able to cut it into these pieces. What so what I'm going to do... do you, what kind of bacon is the best kind? You know, it's what, the, for me, the best thing to do is to find one made locally by some wacky artisanal person. And, but there's this club called the Bacon of the Month Club. Have you ever heard of that? No. It's on this website called thegratefulpalate.com. And they have, and I sent this to my family last year for their Christmas present, every month you get a two-pound package of bacon from some crazy place in Iowa or Florida or the, the Smoky Mountains. And they're all different, and some of them are too smoky or too salty, but some of them are really, really good, and it works out really, really well. So there's infinite variety and option in the bacon world. Now I'm going to take these parsnips, which I've peeled, and although this is one of my favorite dishes, they do not eat parsnips in Italy. So this is a dish that's inspired by the concept of Italian cooking, but really represents exactly what I want you to do as the home cook in America. I want you to go out and buy ingredients like collards and black beans and black-eyed peas and stuff like that, and use it as an Italian would, designing and designing your own kind of personalized cuisine, because that's what Italian food's all about. It's really understanding that once you've learned the basic ideas behind making these dishes, that the sky's the limit in creating Italian food in the style of Mississippi, or in the style of wherever you happen to be right now. And that's kind of where it becomes its own little zenny thing. I'm going to save the thick ends of the parsnips, which tend to be just a little starchier, and I'll throw them in the next time I make mashed potatoes. Now, I've got my butter, and I wanted it nice and brown, just like this, because that's going to add a certain nuttiness to it. The way you stop your butter from browning is to either add water or acid, but some kind of a liquid. And what it's going to do is it's going to spatter all over the place, so watch out. Wow. And that's all right, because what that's done is stop the butter from cooking, and it's left that kind of nice hazelnut toasted butter flavor behind. And now we're going to take out our tortelli, and we drain them well. Then we toss them in the pan with all that... Need I say anything else? I mean, <laughs> just, just look at that. I mean, you know that's right. And you know that we just made it, despite all the body parts of Venus. This is exactly what it should be. And while it's in the pan, we're going to grate a little of the indisputed king of cheese should over you, it. Should you put the sauce on pasta from directly from the, put the pasta right into the pan? Like Always. Mm -hmm. Definitely. The way that you can create the two distinct and separate concepts, the noodle and the condiment, and bring them together as one, na, 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 <laughs> is to put them in the pan like this and toss them. Because these, right now, having been cooked in that water, are now ready to absorb something. And what we want them to absorb is, in fact, just the sauce, but we don't want it to be swimming in a bowl of sauce. We want it to be just dressed so that it's just perfect, like a salad. Then you take it like that, and notice there's almost no extra stuff, because it's all about balance. And then at the last second here, I take this little plain grater, and I create a little Emilian snowfall, <laughs> right? And then tell me, who, who but the most jaded <laughs> would not want a bowl of this pasta? Here we are, guys. Lose the, uh, Thank you. lose the backbone there. And go ahead and serve them up, Maggie. Now, what I've got here is my pancetta starting to brown, which is exactly where we want it. These parsnips we want to caramelize, so now we're gonna Thank stir you. them through. Is it the season for parsnips? Is that is that the right? season for parsnips is the end of the summer until about the beginning of spring. It's one of those kind of root vegetables that will hold on. So you can, but I mean they're available around. And if you didn't find parsnips, you could use carrots or you could use winter squash. Or you could use just about anything in this. Now what we did is we continued to roll out a little bit more pasta, and what we did is we've dusted it with a little bit of extra flour and allowed it to rest. Go ahead and eat, guys. Ooh. All right. And we've allowed it to rest to kind of dry so that these will separate. Delicious. Now, to cut them into tagliatelle, we're going to just take our knife, like so, and cut right across it. Ooh, hot. Is it hot inside? <laughs> but delicious. And then we go like this, 
And now we have this beautiful little pile of noodles. And you just toss these in the fridge with a little bit of extra flour so that they don't adhere to each other. When we come back, I'll show you how we bring these beautiful tagliatelle together with those parsnips to create something as one. So stay with us. Welcome back. Now, I made a whole mess of these tagliatelle, which comes from tagliare, to cut. And now I'm going to add just a little bit of parsley here, a touch of black pepper, and all the while tossing. Remember, I pulled those noodles out just short of al dente, and what I want to do now is plate them up. So I'll take about them to the boil. How long bowl. is that? About how long? Is it depends on how long I allowed them to dry. Oh, you mean in the pan or in the boiling water? In the boiling water. In the boiling water, anywhere from about 45 seconds to two minutes, because you don't want them to get too soft, but you want them to cook all the way through. If there's a mistake that Americans make, it's that they tend to undercook their fresh pasta because they'll buy it in the store and they throw it in the water and it looks like it's soft in about 10 seconds, and that is a big mistake. So you want it to be cooked and it'll set. It'll have this kind of al dente ness. But by all means, Maggie, go ahead and serve it up. <laughs> Here's new plates. Now, the next dish we're going to make is lasagna, probably the most important classic baked pasta of all. And what we're going to do is we're going to take chopped, cooked spinach. We're going to chop it up really, really finely. Then we're going to take the same amount of eggs. We're going to put that all together in a food processor and puree it together. Then we're going to put it in the flour and make it just like in the well method, where you mix it all together, and then you form it, and then you knead it, and then you allow it to rest, and it makes a dough that looks just like that. <laughs> then we're going to run it through. She's happy? <laughs> That's good. I love that snickering sound when someone's serving food. Then what we do is we roll out the sheets, but instead of cutting them like I did, we just take them to the water, and we just drop them in like so. And they're going to set and cook and you don't have to worry about them sticking and you don't have to add any oil because the noodle is already ready and poised to do something and what we're going to do then is take it out of that water once it's cooked and in fact drop it into ice cold water like so and then take it out and kind of just let it rest on towels or paper towels. Why do you drop it in the ice water? That immediately stops the cooking process, and it sets the noodle to a nice firmness so that I can work with it. If I took it out of there and tried to work with it, it'll still be like that. Sticky, dangerous, hard to do. We don't want that. The reason we're draining is because we don't want too much water component in our baked pasta. So I'm going to take them like that, and I'm going to pat them down with a little towel. How do you know when they're done? The fresh pasta cooks in about a minute or two minutes, depending. You really can't overcook it at this point because you're going to cook it again. And it's just, really, we're not looking for al dente-ness in our lasagna. We're looking for something to just kind of hold everything together. Now, what I have here is a ragu bolognese or any classic meat sauce. And I take a couple of spoons of that. What does ragu mean? Ragu just means something that's cooked together slowly. In this case, though, although in, in Bologna, ragu means ragu bolognese, or this meat sauce, which is carrots, onion, celery, all cooked together in mm -hmm. uh, butter, then tomato paste, and then white wine, and then red, uh, uh, white wine, and then milk, all dragged together. Now I'm going to take bechamel, which is the milk sauce, mm -hmm. which is just milk thickened with a bit of a roux and seasoned with some nutmeg. And then we're going to take another layer of the ragu and layer it on like this. And you just go on and on and on and on, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, until you've got this whole guy all filled up. But you can make lasagna out of anything, can't you? Exactly, and in fact, this is lasagna al forno alla bolognese, which is how they make it in Bologna. But in, in Emilia Romagna, there are different varieties, and in, let's delicious. see, what am I looking for? I know what I'm looking for, to pull my noodles here Parsnips now that they're boiled. Are delicious in this. Should you wait to serve the pasta, like if it's too hot, it's if it's too, too no, actually, the, the noodles like this mm -hmm. come straight to the mm -hmm. table because they can't be too hot even if someone burns their mouth. Lasagna, on the other hand, we're going to want to take out of the oven and we're going to let it rest for about 20 minutes. When we come back, I'll have put this one in, I will have taken it out, and we will be dining a la bolognese. So please stay with us.
So this is what it ends up looking like. Wow. Now the whole trick to this and understanding the whole resting idea is this is in the same sense as understanding what meat cookery is all about. At this point everything is bubbling and boiling and boiling and bubbling. And what that means is that first of all it's too hot to put in your mouth. <laughs> but second of all what's happening is there's a lot of action in there. There's a lot of movement in there. And if you were to challenge the integrity of the whole by cutting out a piece right now, everything's going to slide like a pie. And we'll show you that in a second because really what you need to do when you're eating lasagna, and if you've ever eaten lasagna in Bologna, the city, it's just like this one. <laughs> What you have to do is let it rest, and they actually serve it at just a bit warmer than room temperature. They'll take these out at, say, 1245, knowing that most Italian lunch guests arrive between about 115 and 145. And they'll never reheat it. They'll dust it with a little Parmigiano cheese, and then they'll just bring it to you. And in, in fact, in my favorite restaurant in Bologna, there's a place called Diana, where they take the le regalie, the little gifts of the unborn eggs of the chicken, and they'll poach them, and then they'll just kind of sprinkle them over the top. Mm -hmm. So that's the scoop. That's how they make fresh pasta all over the world. I want to thank you guys for being here. You've made it a heck of a lot of fun. I want to thank you guys for being here because you've made it a heck of a lot of fun. And I'll see you on the next Molto Mario. Ciao. So we'll cut one anyway just to show you what it looks like.